Hello, YouTube. Welcome to the United States of Anxiety. I'm Kushan Avadar, and I'm filling in for Kai Wright this week. Now, if you've been tuning into this stream, you might know who I am. But if this is your first time watching, welcome. We're so happy to have you. I'm the senior digital producer on the show, and we're all so excited to have you join us for the next hour. So the show's going to start in a few minutes. It's going to last for about 50 minutes, and it is coming to you out of WNYC Studios in New York City. Before we get started, I want to quickly check in with the whole team that's coming up with the show, starting off with Rahima, who's another producer who helps make the show. Hey, Rahima. Hey, Rahima, uh, we can't hear you. Are you on mute? Yes, hey. I am on mute. All good. Um, it's live. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, I'm really excited for today's show. I'm also really excited to be you today, Kusha, <laughs> while you are being Kai. Upgrade. Uh, yes. Perhaps so. For you. For um, you. It's, for your position, of course. Yes. Um, so that means I am going to be pulling the strings over here on YouTube. And I'm really looking forward to the show today uh, because, you know, it's about something that I've really struggled to wrap my head around, um, which is crypto. You know, it's been embraced by many of the usual suspects, mm -hmm. celebrities, tech bros, CEOs, venture capitalists. So it seems totally out of my league uh, because <laughs> I am not wealthy. But then, uh, you know, I started working on the show with Yakusha, mm -hmm. and I realized that there's actually a lot more to it. And there's a lot of potential here to serve this whole other community of people that have been mostly left behind by like the f current financial system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are the folks that we're going to focus on during today's show. Basically, people in underbank communities who the financial system often leaves behind or sometimes takes advantage of. So the big question for today's show is if you're one of those people, could crypto equalize the playing field or is this just another predatory scheme? And all the promise that we hear in these commercials are just smoke and mirrors. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we really want to hear from you all on this topic. So if you're from one of these underbank communities and you've invested in crypto, please, please chime in in the YouTube chat and tell us why. What attracted you to make this investment? Do you feel optimistic about it? Or maybe you're in this community and you want nothing to do with it. Um, we still want to hear from you either way. So please write to us in the chat and next to our stream. Yep. And if you have questions for our guests, and we have two fantastic guests with us, Dr. or sorry, Scott Estrada, who comes to us from FinTech and focusing on consumer regulation, and Dr. Courtney Ziegler, who's a race and technology practitioner at a fellow at Stanford University. If you have questions for them, like Rahima said, put it in the chat. Or if you really want, you could call us 212-433-WNYC. And it's not just me and Rahima. We've got a whole team here with us. So first, I want to call out Milton who's over on the boards. Hey, Milton, nice working with you today in this position. Uh, he's making sure all the sound sounds great. We've also got Karen Frillman, our editor. Karen, how you doing? Are you excited for the show tonight? I'm very excited. I, I am, well, first of all, Steph Curry, you know, yeah. support the show, so what can I say? He's my guy, <laughs> even though I'm a New Yorker, sure. guy can play. So I am very curious to hear what people say, though, and what our listeners are thinking about. So, yeah, that's what I'm in it for. Yeah, me too. So, you know, leave it in the chat if you've got an idea. Thanks, Karen. We've also got Katie Steele, our intern, who's handling the phones. Hey, Katie, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Kusha. Hey, Katie. Are you excited for tonight's show? Very. Yeah, great. Glad to have you manning the or being the person on the phones. And then finally, joining us for tonight only, we're lucky to have Luke Green helping us out on the phones, too. Hey, Luke, how you doing? Hi, how's it going? Good Happy to be here. Excited to help out. Great. Nice to have you. Thanks for hopping in with us. All right. We're about to get started. But before we do, a few housekeeping things just to tell you about. Remember to comment, to like, to subscribe to WNYC's channel if you like what you're hearing. All of that stuff. We're going to get deep into crypto. We're going to find out what it means and what it doesn't mean. So stick around. We're going to start in less than a minute and we'll be right back. Thanks for watching with us.
interested in understanding what it can do for me personally. Cryptocurrency, I feel like it is very gendered, actually. Like, the men in my life talk about it and the women do not. It also feels like a little bit of disingenuousness when it comes to some of the celebrities endorsing it and trying to create a sense of urgency around it. A lot of people are uncomfortable with that, but I believe there might be some opportunities there if we will let ourselves be open to it. Welcome to the show. I'm Kusha Navadar filling in for Kai Wright. The first time I heard about cryptocurrency, it was 2013. I was in grad school for public policy. So a professor told us about this thing, this new currency called Bitcoin. No, you couldn't put it in a bank or use it in a store unless you counted one random pizza shop on campus. But the real value of Bitcoin, we were told, was that you didn't need a bank to use it. And for the public policy nerds in the room, you could see the light bulbs go off. This technology, so it seemed, could empower are people who the traditional banking system leaves behind. People without a credit score, first generation immigrants who have to send money back home, communities living in places where the government is highly corrupt. So jump ahead about a decade to 2021. The value of Bitcoin has skyrocketed. People are getting rich on paper. And suddenly the conversation around cryptocurrency is different. It's less about how we can use the technology and more about not missing your chance to get rich. The people talking about Bitcoin aren't professors in universities. It's celebrities, athletes. It's Alec Baldwin. Let me guess, you're too busy to watch this ad. Just like you were too busy to invest in Bitcoin. This is Steph Curry, the world's leading expert on cryptocurrency. No, I'm not an expert and I don't need to be. A trade, are you, are you sure? Not a trade trade, I'm trading crypto. How come only some people got the best financial tools? What about everyone else? Digital currencies like Bitcoin are the future. Well, we know what happened and I'm gonna be real with you. I invested and half of what I put in is gone. So I want to be a little bit of a consumer guide here. Can crypto be a force for good or is it really limited to just buying a slice of pizza? And I want to hear what you think. If you've invested in crypto, what attracted you to it in the first place? And how do you feel now? 212-433-WNYC. That's 212-433-9692. All right, let's get to it. I'm joined by Scott Estrada, a policy expert who works at the intersection of financial technology and consumer protection. He's on the teaching faculty at Georgetown Law, and he works for a financial technology firm in San Francisco. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kusha. Absolutely. So you've got a long list of accolades in this arena. You've testified before Congress multiple times on financial tech policy. You've authored a dozen articles on race, equity, and financial inclusion. It seems like you live, eat, and breathe financial tech and consumer protection. Can you tell me where does that passion come from? Yeah, Similar to you, I'm always uh, very, very uh, excited and fill my <clears throat> fill my nights with reading about the latest innovations in financial technology and uh, Bitcoin. I will say I was also late to the bus and also invested and also lost uh, so, some mm-hmm. money before I dug in a little deeper. Um, Can you tell us about maybe the personal story that you might have bringing the conversation to yeah. today now? <clears throat> yeah, a lot of my work, um, as you mentioned, I've probably been in the public policy and financial technology space for about 10 to 12 years now. Um, I really, uh, the work that I do is, is actually quite personal. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a first, first generation across the board of, of my family, first generation to be born in this country, first generation to finish college, first generation to even know what a 401k is. Uh, my parents came here in the late seventies and uh, unfortunately I had a very early experience to the worst side of, of the financial service system of, of those that they exclude and kind of being ensnared in this shadow, you know, shadow economy of unfortunately payday lenders and rent to own and, and pawn shops. Unfortunately, that was a large part of how my family made a, made a way in the world. And from a very early age, I had a, a very deep sense of, of resentment and frustration toward that. And that manifested toward uh, pursuing my studies in financial inclusion, especially along race and equity lines, and, and really bringing a sense of what my family went through, what I'm trying to continually escape um, and bring that kind of 
lifeblood to what can sometimes be a little bit of a dry policy discussion mm-hmm. when you get a little far in the weeds. Not saying I don't love diving deep and being a policy nerd as much as the next person, but um, a lot of my passion, a lot of my work is centered around bringing a little bit of life and a little bit of fire to this discussion because yeah. the stakes are are high. When we talk about financial inclusion, for me, it's not a conceptual novelty. It's it's my parents, my community, my friends that still are, are, are working through uh, sometimes from uh, you know before the starting line to get ahead. And where did your family move from? Uh, so my family's from Cordoba, Argentina. There's mm-hmm. about three or four generations of ranchers, um, and the, the 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 work ethic there to to say it's strong is is an understatement. It's mm-hmm. uh, you know as my father said, don't uh, don't ever let me see you being bored because there's plenty of things to do around the house. Uh, and you know if you're up at eight a.m., you're sleeping in. Yeah. So obviously your work ethic kind of came through with how much work you're doing in this area now. And I guess that brings us to your work with cryptocurrency and the technology behind it. Um, I want to set the stakes for everyone and I don't want to get caught in the technical weeds here, but let's just say someone on the street asked you why this technology is special. What would you say? And if they don't ever plan to invest or use crypto, why should they care? That's a great question. And if you'll indulge me, I promise you I'm not answering your question with a question, a question, but for me, why folks should care about this is because it does, it is one of those watershed moments in financial innovation, that there is an objective, disruptive technology that has changed the game. Now, the questions of, of ethics and who is that benefiting and who is it not, those are much needed follow-up questions. But the reason why this is important is because it, this is going to be a part of our lives at, you know, within the next few years and the next decade, hmm. this is going to be what ultimately online banking was in the early 2000s and, and how revolutionary that was and changing how our day-to-day financial lives, whether it's direct deposit, whether it's transferring money through Zelle, whether it's um, investing, whatever it is, it, it is that level of a technological disruption. So the stakes yeah. are high to know what it's about. And if this is your area of interest, or passion, it's essential for you to know so you can have a voice to, to guide the ship in the right direction, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about how it might serve communities that are often left behind in the traditional banking system. Uh, what do those communities look like and what could this technology enable for them that wasn't possible before? Great starting point. So so for me, the, the focus, this, especially this discussion, is the unbanked, the underbanked, individuals that are in the crosshairs of some of the worst predatory actors in in the space, you know, triple digit interest, payday loans, rent to own, installment lending of the worst kind, um, you know, everything from your kind of bread and butter pawn shop. So individuals that don't have access to a financial system that empowers them to build wealth, create savings, build an on ramp for generational economic mobility, you're kind of left left to the to the wolves, so to speak. And, and many of that has been by design. And I'm sure that can be the topic of a whole other discussion. Um, many, many times that's by design. Sometimes it's um, the individuals who are building the system, so to speak, inside and out from a technology, from a, s- a services point of view, don't reflect the individuals using the product, whether that's right. thin credit, credit invisibles, immigrant communities. So by design or by actual exclusion, communities are kind of pushed out of the mainstream financial system and into kind of the shadows and and where some of these more nefarious actors operate. And And so if you think about crypto, what could crypto offer these communities that they normally don't get um, and they're often left out of? So so that I think is probably the second or third follow-up of where it can be a driver of financial inclusion. I think where we are in the present, the technology is so new and if you, I, I'll probably take about three minutes just for context in terms of what cryptocurrency is for the focus of this discussion. So when somebody says cryptocurrency, usually what comes to mind is an actual Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin. Uh, it's, it's more for the purpose of financial inclusion. It's more productive to think of cryptocurrency as an exchange, an exchange of digital assets done 100% online. And what that means is if I go right now and buy something at Amazon, for 
I can go to my bank account and it'll say $10 deducted from Scott's account and then Amazon and their account will say $10 from Scott Estrada for their product. Those two ledgers are not visible to anyone other than their owners. Cryptocurrency basically is a giant public ledger of that transaction of both where the money is coming from and where it's going to Mm -hmm. without the need for a financial institution. So it's ultimately a public ledger where you can um, enter where money is coming from and where it's going to, and it's verifiable. And it, like I said, the technology is obviously much more complicated, but what it allows is that you ultimately at the end of the day, don't need banks or financial institutions to facilitate this transaction. And when we talk about banks, you know, who have minimum deposits, banks who have overdraft fees, banks who require you know, sometimes credit to open up an account uh, or, or do, um, you know, financial background checks, you ultimately are decentralizing the transaction um, and allowing one individual to transmit a digital asset to another directly. So could you say and, maybe if you were, let's say, just a first generation immigrant, for instance, and you needed to send money back home, but you had a lot of fees and maybe the people you were sending it back to didn't have access to the banks that they might be able to receive it. Is this a place where crypto could make a difference? Yes. If you have access to the internet and you have access to the network, you have access to transferring these digital assets. So, you know, I have a lot of friends that send money back uh, home that are first generation and, and Western Union. Sometimes the closest one is two hours away from the the place where the family lives and they have to coordinate take a bus for two hours to get to the Western Union. If that money never shows up, they don't have the right confirmation number. The person called in sick that day, then that's a whole other day that person has to wait for those funds. Mm -hmm. If you have access to the internet, you have access to the network, and therefore you have access to transferring these digital assets back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, The kind of the biggest promise, and if, you know, probably what you see in the news most is somebody investing a hundred dollars in Bitcoin and then they wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden there's $10,000. Um, and right. That has gained up enough attention where people are thinking, Oh, th- is this a possibility where I can build a retirement fund on this, where I can put yeah. my savings in crypto and that's much better than in a savings. And that, that's going to be a separate discussion. Well, let's have that discussion in a second because we're about to hit a break. But what I would love to hear from folks is, are you thinking about crypto in different ways? We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. This is the United States of Anxiety. I'm Kusha Navadar filling in for Kai Wright. And this week we're talking about the promise and perhaps the failure of cryptocurrency. I'm with Scott Estrada, a policy expert in financial technology and consumer protection who teaches at Georgetown Law. And Scott, I'd like to get to one of the core questions we're thinking about right now. Uh, Is this technology, when it comes to communities that might be left behind by the traditional banking system, 
Is it a force for good, for bad, or something in the middle? And I know that with this discussion, there's a lot to talk about with the environment and climate change, because there's huge questions about how much of an effect this has on environmental sustainability. So help us make sense of this. How should we think about it? Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll take the easy answer and say somewhere in the middle. But what, I, what I'll give you for that is the, the force for good in terms of being a driver of financial inclusion is, I think, clearly a, we're far from that point where the technology is. Because if you look at what drives the crypto market, it's very similar to what drives any market is where is the who's making the money, where's the profit from. And at this point in the techno technological development, it's not yet, quote unquote, profitable to be a driver for financial inclusion. So when you know, it, it is an investment and speculation vehicle. And the problem with that is uh, kind of what you alluded to is if individuals who don't have disposable income or are putting money that should go into more stable or financial um, wealth building options or putting in cryptocurrency, that's where it gets very problematic because the difference between say like Shiba and Litecoin and Dogecoin is similar to the different internet browsers on the internet, Google, Chrome, uh, Microsoft Explorer. They're all particular ways of organizing those transactions that I talked about. Hmm. And what investors do is saying, which has the best technology to do this? What is the future of cryptocurrency? Is, is Bitcoin going to be the future of crypto? Is it Litecoin? Is it Doge? That's speculation right now because the technology is so new. That's similar to betting on lottery tickets as mm -hmm. a long-term um, kind of financial strategy. So that should not be, in my opinion, my personal opinion, that is not the realm for true financial inclusion and wealth building because those you're talking about high stakes, retirement funds, safety, uh, you know, rainy day funds. Those, once you start taking money that type of money from communities and then putting into a speculative game of uh, investment vehicles. That's where I get concerned gotcha. in terms of the problem, the, where the, the, the failures of, but as an underlying technology where you can have individuals transferring digital assets without financial intermediaries, that means you don't have to worry about interest rates, um, exchange rates internationally, the transaction fees for these are tremendously minimal. Um, in terms of the cost of sending it, similar to what you alluded to, the environmental concern is drastic because the thousands and thousands of computers it takes to run these cryptocurrencies takes a lot of electricity and has tremendous amount of sustainability issues. Yeah, yeah. And I think we want to pause there for a second because we have a caller. Before we go to that caller, though, I just want to give out the call out again. If you'd like to call in and let us know your opinion about cryptocurrency, you can call 212-433-WNYC. That's 212-433-9692. Someone in particular I'd like to offer to call in is Mayor Eric Adams. We know that you're working with uh, crypto as part of your work in our city's government. You offered to get it's part of your paychecks paid in in crypto and Bitcoin, I believe. Uh, if you would like to call in and let us know what's on your mind with how it could serve communities that are often left behind, let us know. 212-433-WNYC, 212-433-9692. And we have our first caller, John from BQE. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for calling. Hi, uh, it's, it's great to be on. And i uh, um, Thanks so much for taking my call. I, I'm just uh, wondering why we're not, um, I mean, Scott alluded to it briefly there, but we're not talking about. John, you there? Did we lose you? Matt is, you know, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. We got you back. Oh, and you know that uh, many of these uh, power plants and stuff that are getting opened up are actually in communities that are already struggling with a lot of pollution. So. Mm -hmm. I also wonder, uh, Scott, this is for you. I wonder if you uh, actually know what percentage of uh, transactions right now are actually peer-to-peer -peer and not just uh, some sort of uh, speculative asset on a pollution casino. Um, thanks. I'll take it off the air. Yeah, thanks so much, John, for calling in. So I heard two pieces there. The first part was this impact actually having a huge environmental impact on communities that are most susceptible and the second talking about what that percentage of peer-to-peer -peer is scott what do you think about that yeah so so for the first one it is a huge uh, problem and in terms of the environmental impact of running 
that many computer systems on electrical grid, where those power plants are being built. Uh, many times uh, the biggest kind of Bitcoin mining systems are in Iceland because they, the, the amount of money it costs to even cool the amount of computers it takes is phenomenal, let alone the, the use of power. So one of the kind of, I'm going to say promises of these different coins. So the difference, say, again, between Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, Shiba coin, these are all different technologies that are uh, capturing that transaction on that ledger I was talking about. Some of them are built on the premise that they are more efficient, that they take less and less computing power to actually uh, transact. So the they decrease in the carbon put, footprint that those would have. So that is actually one of, now whether that's a marketing ploy or, or a verifiable claim is one thing, but there is at least an acknowledgement of that issue in some of the coins, the newer coins or how they're, the further iterations of those are happening. Mm. As for the second question, it's, it's hard for me to say because a lot of another big part that we haven't touched on is the anonymity of um, the ledger and blockchain, which blockchain is not a cryptocurrency. It's actually a technology used by each coin, so to speak, to encrypt and ensure the integrity of that ledger. So that ledger is, you can't defraud it, so to speak. That's a whole other discussion. But it's anonymous in that the, the, your particular name and personal information aren't on the ledger, but there are individual IDs. So you can see from one wallet to another you know, X amount of Bitcoin left and X amount of Bitcoin was received, but you don't have access to who that, who those people are or who those entities mm -hmm. are. So it's, it's hard to get a sense of what percentage are individuals, institutional investors or speculators, but the, the purchases you can track. So if $5 million of Bitcoin is transacted and then resold again in the next 30 seconds, that'll be captured on the ledger most likely that's an institutional investor when you're talking about those amounts. So that's how you can kind of back into it. So we had another question from Carolyn in Greenwich. Unfortunately, uh, we lost the call, but she was wondering, is crypto really a tax dodge? And this is something that I think is on the minds of a lot of folks right now that separate kind of the have from the have nots. Uh, is crypto really just a vehicle for people who are already uh, wealthy to, to get wealthier? Or is it something different than that? So from a from a tax point of view, that is a very interesting question because that was front and center um, a lot of the last couple of years where now a lot of the big platforms that you can trade currency on are required to report gains and losses to the IRS. So there is a record and you will be, you will have to pay that. Now, when you're trading off of those platforms and it's just you interacting directly with the ledger, obviously there's much more space there to kind of cover up income streams or actual gains and losses. And I think much more, much like the other financial markets when you can move that much money very quickly and kind of outside of financial institutions that have been designed to capture income mm -hmm. and you're moving it kind of off the grid, uh, there is a lot of space, a lot of space for income manipulation as well. When you're talking about directly um, Inter interacting with the ledger and not one of the companies that uh, like, I don't want to say names, but uh, some of the apps you can download to say, here's a $500, buy me $500 in Bitcoin. So it, it makes me also think about, so there's, you're saying there's folks who are trying to move it off of uh, traditional ways of tracking. How about for folks maybe on the other side of that coin where they deal mostly with cash? Uh, there's a lot of folks, I mean, I guess the classic example in New York City is people who sell weed. They deal with a lot of cash historically. Uh, does cryptocurrency play any role in helping them be able to get more financial tools? Uh, definitely. No, I'd say it's pretty much the antithesis of cash. Um, I think uh, almost pejoratively, some of the marketing messages is that cash is kind of a dinosaur and it doesn't account for a lot of communities that live in a cash economy, small business owners, immigrant communities. You know, my, my mom to this day still has a jar of cash over the refrigerator as the rainy day fund, because, you know, that's just part of, part of her upbringing. So that, that is another community, I would say, unfortunately, and intentionally left behind by crypto where cash is the, the moniker is, you know, cash is trash, uh, so mm -hmm. to speak, but it also opens up fraud at another level because there are a lot of reports where individuals will rely on somebody hearing about Bitcoin 
and buying into this get rich uh, quick scheme and selling them actual tokens that that have the bitcoin logo that are just fabricated nothing but will sell these individuals for hundreds of dollars and say here's your bitcoin and there's a lot there's act that type of fraud is actually more common than than you would think mm, gotcha. of individuals just creating coins saying here's a bitcoin and somebody who doesn't um know that that's not actually a bitcoin people have lost hundreds of dollars in that sense i and see I think, so it's a predatory tool in that sense yeah. what you're describing and, and i think it's the responsibility of the media sources that endorse this type of uh technology to also give all sides of the story so like you know th there's an uh obligation to educate as well as promote if you're right. going to do one you have to do both in my my opinion yeah uh, we have another caller emmanuel from new jersey emmanuel welcome to the show thanks for calling yeah, hi, thanks for taking my call. Question is, going back to the Western Union example, uh, uh, how does the receiver use Bitcoin once the money is transferred to them? I'll take my answer over here. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much, Emmanuel. So Scott, uh, he's asking, yes. what's that process look like? That That's a, a great question. And I think that's one of the... Um, <clears throat> one of the big issues as well, because if you have Bitcoin, where are you going to spend it? So there's companies like Tesla, um, Microsoft, a couple of others that initially were like, Hey, you, you could buy our products with Bitcoin only to later kind of backpedal on that. Um, you know, there's that story, the famous story. I don't even know if it's true or an urban myth now where somebody in 2012 paid for a pizza with Bitcoin. And mm. now that Bitcoin is worth $10 million like any financial currency, if you don't have somebody that accepts that currency, you might as well have nothing. Um, so until there's a widespread acceptance of that Bitcoin, that's a great, that question raises a perfect, uh, perfectly salient point. Well, what do you do with that Bitcoin? You can mm -hmm. make, transfer it to another wallet, but if you're looking for direct purchase of goods and services, um, that is polemicized by if you just google crypto market crash today you'll see how the crypto market has been decimated by the broader economic headwinds and that's again whole other yeah <laughs> other but, but, but you know it, it leads me to this other piece of it when you think about crypto as as the asset in and of itself like you said the market has fallen so much this year so for me i'm thinking like what's next is crypto here to stay or is it basically the tulip bulb in the 1600s or for the millennials out there the beanie babies of the 90s like what are we thinking about for crypto as we move forward yeah, uh, this is my personal analogy would be, I would think of it as like the dot com bust in the early 2000s, where you had new technology, and you had the internet just kind of breaking the horizon of, of mass consumption. And the hundreds of internet companies that just kind of sprung up overnight. Many of them didn't do anything, many of them didn't sell anything, but they all had the proper branding and investors were pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars once that market imploded the kind of ones that survived that actually were legitimate businesses had a chance to develop and grow now there's another question of what happened there and who benefited and who didn't but i think similar to this is kind of like a reckoning for the crypto uh market is that there will be some companies and platforms that survive and this might be kind of that necessary iteration for the technology to become something that's more permanent and mainstream. And I think once that happens, for me, what I get excited about is then once we have a reliable technology that's regulated with the consumer protections, you can build something that's really life-changing for low and moderate income borrowers, uh, individuals who've been marginalized from the financial system, you can build solutions on that. But right now it's so speculative, so new. I'm very skeptical of, especially when it comes to uh, low and moderate income borrowers, communities of color, immigrant communities, hmm. the stakes are very high for mistakes for them. It isn't just an investment loss. It's somebody's generational yeah. trajectory. Yeah. You know, we've got time for, I think, for, for one more question from our audience. And this one actually comes online. It's from YouTube. Uh, the question is about non-custodial accounts. What about them? Yeah. And so that is prob probably one of the things that's most forward looking is that Custodial accounts is so similar when you deposit $1,000 into your Bank of America or PNC or any bank account. 
um, I don't bank with either one of those just for transparency. Um, they're actually holding your money for you. Um, and then you have certain claims and certain uh, obligations, certain protections from that. So they um, are holding that even though you're there, you have a claim on the ownership. Non-custodial accounts, I think, make things much more nuanced in that the owner of the underlying crypto asset is different from the individual that's putting their money on a platform that's then investing that money in cryptocurrency. So for non-custodial accounts, I think that opens up the discussion a lot more than if we're just talking about traditional, do you have an individual who has internet access able to integrate with the blockchain directly, as opposed to somebody who is relying upon apps or third-party developers to create a platform where they give X amount of money and then that money is invested. So gotcha. if you if you Google Voyager bankruptcy, I think this will uh, this is exactly what's at stake um, in terms of a platform going under and everyone who had money invested in that platform ultimately now doesn't have their money. And whatever Scott, it was put in. are you invested in crypto? So I actually lost enough where I kind of learned my lesson and, and pulled most of it out um, in that. So I think um, this is not something I have a risk appetite for. It's not something that I'm interested in for investment purposes i'm more interested in the the policy implications of the technology and i like to be as as objective as possible on that so gotcha not, not anymore is, is the <laughs> short answer and and last thing i want to ask you before we let you go and maybe just like one sentence if you had advice for somebody listening at home what would it be as they navigate crypto yeah and, and i'm not allowed to give financial advice so this is this isn't any but one of the just be um mindful of who you're giving your money to invest in hmm. because 99% chance you're not inter interacting with the blockchain of, yeah. with the ledger yourself. You're giving your money to someone else to do it for you. And the fine print on those can be very scary. So you should definitely read it and make sure you know who you're giving your money to, especially when it comes to crypto. Scott Estrada is on the teaching faculty at Georgetown Law, and he works at the intersection of financial technology and consumer advocacy. Scott, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So our conversation tonight is about cryptocurrency, who it serves. But like any technology, that conversation needs to include the makers, the creators. We're going to talk to one of them right after this. Stay with us.
Welcome back. This is the United States of Anxiety. I'm Kusha Navadar, filling in for Kai Wright. I love technology. I remember figuring out how to repurpose my mom's old Palm Pilot to download a Harry Potter book so I could read them in the day they came out. I kind of skipped the whole buy your books on Amazon requirement, so please don't report me to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> technology isn't good or bad. It's how you use it. And I'm reminded of one of America's most influential innovators, uh, George Washington Carver, the scientist, the botanist, the inventor. He said, the primary idea in all of my work was to help the the farmer and fill the poor man's empty dinner pail. My idea is to help the man farthest down. This is why I have made every process just as simply as I could to put it within his reach. Three quarters of a century later, we can hear the echo of that story. And I want to hear from a creator who's thinking about where we go next from here with cryptocurrency. Dr. Courtney Ziegler is a race and technology practitioner fellow at Stanford University. He's also the founder and CEO of Well Money, whose work and research focuses on building financial solutions and education for the black diaspora. Dr. Ziegler, welcome to the show. Hey, Kusha, thanks so much for having me. Happy Sunday again. Happy Sunday. It's great to be here. And, and you're yeah, calling in from you. uh, quite far away. Is that right? Yes, South Africa. So it's like almost 1 a.m. in the morning here, but Oof. I'm excited to, to have this conversation. So I stayed up. So I appreciate you burning that midnight oil with us. Thank you so much. For so sure. let's start off with your story. You live in, well, it's not right now, but you generally do live in Oakland, California, an area that's at their intersection of tech and social justice. But I imagine your interest in this space started even before you moved to the Bay. What was the first time you learned about crypto and how did you arrive at this space? Yeah, I'm going to take it a little bit back. Thanks for sharing your uh, repurposing your Palm Pilot, <laughs> your mom's Palm Pilot story. That's really awesome because when I was a kid, I was very interested in technology as well. Um, and just was really fascinated with the possibilities of the internet. Um, I'm an 80s baby. So like we're right like on the edge of like the beginning of the personal computer and things like that. So that totally fascinated me. Um, taught myself to code as a teen when I first got a computer and just been in love ever since. And so I've had a really awesome kind of trajectory working in the technology industry, um, building things with software, but also kind of bringing my academic background into the space um, and was introduced to actually Dogecoin like maybe 10 years ago. Hmm. Um, and that was my first like really serious introduction with cryptocurrency. It was like before Bitcoin. And that opened the doors to me about what Bitcoin was and like, you know, digital money and the possibility of what it could do. Um, and I've just been a, a fan and a spectator ever since of just watching how it's grown, um, how it's become an investment asset, how it's become an underlying technology for um, the upcoming metaverse and things like that. So that's where I'm at now. I'm really just loving the way, I mean, now it's like really interesting because it's so much, you even mentioned yourself losing money um, investing mm -hmm. in cryptocurrencies, as a lot of us have. Yeah, um, you got to put it all out there, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean who hasn't? If you haven't lost money in cryptocurrency, are you even alive in the 21st century? But um, yeah, so I've just been really fascinated with how the the potentials, the pot potentiality of it. I know we, in the last segment, you talked a little bit about what it could do. Um, and I'm still on the fence about what it could do. Mm. Because I'm just like, oh, that's really rad. Like there, there are certain instances where it's actually been used in ways that it should be, it's been designed for. Um, but we're still relying on banks. Uh, we still, there's so much significant education that needs to be had with people um, to even really understand. There's so much uh, work, design work that needs to go in for people to actually utilize apps that actually transfer Bitcoin. Because not everybody's going to be their own server. That's just not going to happen ever so <laughs> like so, no one's you know so, i'm so sorry to I'm interrupt so you but it like it sparked something in me that i want to dig into a little bit because i honestly wasn't expecting you to say i'm still on the fence about it and you're a creator in this space so i i find i want to really unpackage that let's start off with the people you're yeah. trying to serve so in your mind who are the people that you're serving and how do you think they could be served by cryptocurrency yeah so that's a it's and let me clarify what my, I'm on the fence. Maybe I'm still like, I believe in technology. I believe in the future. I believe in innovation. Um, I think the ways that we've, it's kind of had mainstream adoption. And I, that, by that, I mean like not just use, but understanding like NFTs and like all of these things. It's so that stands for non-fungible token, by the way, yeah, for those people listening. Yeah, non-fungible tokens. Yep. It's, a, it's a digital um, asset. Go ahead. Yeah. 
um, which are basically a digital asset, like shows proof of ownership. Um, think of like a authenticator on a painting or something, like a tangible painting, but have it in the digital world. That's what an NFT is like. It's one only used for one thing, kind of token. Um, and we've seen it like used and I, I really awesomely in ways that have actually generated wealth for young black creators in particular, mm. um, people who have sold NFTs, like who caught the wave when it was going up, right? Who made tons of money from digital art, who were like really building communities and spaces and companies on the possibility and the ideas. That's what I think is really, really, really rad about crypto right now. It's like, there's ideas and, and imagination. Um, it's so, really scary to, um, no, go ahead. No, 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 please, please. I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead. Um, it's really at the same time scary to see that uh, so many people, yeah, th th like thought it was a get rich quick space because a lot of people have, to be honest, but um, you know, the majority of people are not and they're gonna lose their money and they're gonna, you know, put their $20 in Dogecoin. And I knew people who was doing this like last year when Doge was hot and Elon was pumping it, mm. by the way. <laughs> and, like, and like people were like, yeah, Doge, I'm put some money in it. And like they lost their twenty bucks, they lost their like fifty bucks. Um, so it's like a really, you know, yeah. There's possibility, but at the same time, I do see what it the 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 hype and the the lack of I think knowledge about uh, NFTs or stock market. You know, like it's, it's what they are. They're like yeah. it goes up and down. It's valuable. If people say it's valuable. It's not like really that great if nobody wants it. There's so many like cartoon apes now that are useless and that have like drained people's wallets right so that's where like i'm like uh, yeah so let's talk a little awesome bit about possible. how mm -hmm. the the difference that you want to make talk, talk about your work a little bit how you're trying to use crypto to to empower communities yeah thank you uh so i was really kind of got more involved i taught myself to trade and i was like this is really awesome just kind of as a hobby and i started teaching other people um, and this was like maybe five years ago at this point. So I was like, oh, I'm really providing like a different type of education. Um, you know, also like as a technologist myself, like bringing a little bit more to the beyond trading. It's like, this is how it could work. Blockchain technology, exactly what Scott was saying, right? Ledgers, public ledgers, all those things. Um, but yeah, like my work now, I'm building a company where we help uh, people cover financial emergencies. We're dealing with people who cannot afford, if they have a $400 emergency, their like, life is in grave danger, right? Um, these are not people who are wanting to trade Bitcoin. <laughs> no offense. And um, Bitcoin still like movements of cryptocurrency still rely on banks. They still rely on um, exchanges that money has to be, you know, output it to a bank. Um, there's still these infrastructures that in theory, it seems really cool. Like I'm really still behind the idea of, remittances, um, excuse me, but there's still not a great service that does that using crypto. Um, but that's why I think it's awesome because there's room for innovation. There's still room for that, right? Yeah. It's gonna happen. It's just not there yet. So let's maybe talk about what might compel somebody to uh, go into this space. You know, I was just reading um, when I was re researching for tonight's episode, this Pew research poll from last year, it was saying 16% of all Americans have either like invested already or engaged in some way with crypto. And then the super interesting part for me as well was that black, Hispanic and Asian folks in America are doing this at higher rates than their white counterparts. So yeah. for me, that that opens up a whole interesting question. And, and one thing I hate doing, like that I don't want to be doing here is conflating people of color with people who are either disadvantaged or et cetera, because that's just a tired trope. But what I am super interested in is from the perspective of somebody who is a person of color, what would compel this like statistical fact of them investing at higher rates? uh the the opportunity to get rich mm. i mean that's like the main thing like you see um you know like you mentioned it in your intro like celebrities and, and people like it, even like people who are pushing this idea like we can build crypto cities like akon for example and these ideas never materialize they you know some in some instances people are investing money because they're trying to close the the racial wealth gap that you know is part of the United States history. And they see it as an opportunity. And so, you know, people get taken advantage of. Um, people don't have enough money to actually make any money from the investment in the first place. Um, 
so yeah there's like this idea that like we can repair this problematic history in the united states of like other people people of color black people all, all types of people um who don't have access to generational wealth that like you can get it through cryptocurrency and yeah there were some people who again there's uh people who sell their art who have been successful with the nfts there are people who were in the beginning of the the cartoon ape you know mm -hmm. phase who got in early but again that's it's a stock market i mean if you get in early in a lot of things and they're super successful good luck to you but that's not going to create wealth mm. um, for a group of people. It's, it's just, it's just not there yet. Who do you think so, is getting rich off of this? Uh, a lot of people. Um, <laughs> I mean, even myself, I didn't get rich from it, guys. Um, I'd be clear about that, but I did have Bitcoin before it was $3,000 mm. and um, like had Dogecoin just because I worked in the industry and like had it from someone who, um gave me a doge wallet like a long 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 time ago um but i didn't get rich from it like there are individuals who definitely i think people in the united states a lot of young people um i want i don't know the actual demographics so i don't want to be like it's pre predominantly white people because i don't know that mm -hmm. but i do know that a lot of people across the globe um, before like really kind of countries are starting to have regulations about how this money moves because they want to get in on it too. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of people became crypto millionaires for sure. And, you know, we got a uh, comment on our uh, tweet that I want to be sure that I bring up. And it talked about stable coin, which I think is a specific area that might be nuanced here. Um, can you talk a little bit just quickly what stable coins are and also how they may or may not be able to kind of do what you're describing with empowering folks? Yeah, so a stable coin is, well, crypto in, in general, as we know, Bitcoin, it's, you know, measured against Bitcoin, which is exceptionally volatile. <laughs> so <laughs> it could be $60,000 one day and then it crashes down to like 15000 Who knows? It's going in that direction right now, right? Mm -hmm. So a stable coin is the idea that it's, it's like a coin that is in line with like the US dollar, for example, like Tether is a stable coin. It will always be a dollar if the US dollar is a dollar. So the idea is that Bitcoin, like sending it back and forth, like, yeah, it's great. If someone has a wallet, you still have to again have a bank. Um, you still have to have some kind of identity attached to it in some ways. Um, and a stable coin, the same thing, but it's like it um in theory is supposed to kind of avoid fluctuations in the market. So it's it's a stable coin will always be what it's supposed to be. And so when you think about in the future, is this a place where you could maybe be able to reclaim some economic activity if it's stable? I know that there's the, this whole idea about putting a stake in a certain coin and being able to beat out interest rates that banks might offer. I know just enough to be dangerous, so I don't want to push out anything that I might not oh, understand. Yeah. But can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like it might be a path. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I don't know if anybody has been, uh, if any people listening or want to call in um, following the crypto markets, but many, many, many hedge funds, crypto hedge funds and companies have gone bankrupt because people have defaulted on loan. Mm -hmm. It's like a very, it's, I, I mean, crypto is still a young technology, obviously, but it's a very interesting, significant time. Um, so, and some of these are firms and associated with stable coins. So I think that crypto and the technology because it's cryptography could be useful but does it have to be tied to a stock market does it have to be tied to something like that can it be used um in in i don't know in in different ways that i mean it's like i get it it's about money and all these things i just think that um the people who are building or who have the ideas about how to better serve the underbanked um you know the people who are disparate and like wealth, huge gaps are not necessarily the ones who have access to be building it. Mm. Um, and so that's where that's also a problem. Um, but again, that's why I, uh, I'm, I'm my company right now, we're using uh, PayPal. We're not using crypto to get money to people because people have emergencies. They need dollars right now. Yeah. Um, COVID was great because we started, you know, I think it provided some education in terms of, getting people more used to using digital money. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, 
glad to uh, I hope all of this like you know hype about potential investments and all that stuff which is great on some for some folks yeah um and we can get back to thinking about like man it's it's, it's you know technology let's how can we you know let's really think about how we can use this in different ways so well, let's maybe let's talk about like one more idea there so like 10 years from now what do you hope is possible through crypto that isn't possible right now if, if you had a magic wand and and maybe just keep it to like a, a minute in your response for our time yeah um i don't know actually getting money to people easier mm. whatever that means um yeah because it's still kind of difficult and expensive no matter what platform you use so and do you think crypto could do that feasibly because you're talking um, about you still need to do it through a bank you're trying right now with yeah, with you PayPal. yeah. Even, exactly even if it goes through a bank it still could be an addendum to making processes much more smooth um I don't think in, I mean, I don't, you know, again, I'm not a crypto builder and I don't contribute to any nodes or anything, but I do think there are, there could be worthwhile uses um, that even I myself and other kind of founders in the space are not really knowledgeable about because we don't have enough thinkers in the space who are thinking about things other than how do we get rich quick. Mm. So. And if you had one question, 10 seconds, that you could ask somebody that might be listening to this that would help them think about crypto in a new way, what, what question would that be or something you want our audience to respond with? Um, uh, Maybe a question would, maybe a comment would be like, I think education is super important. Ah, yeah. so are you educated? <laughs> what do you know? So That is super important. Dr. Mm -hmm. Courtney Ziegler is a race and technology practitioner fellow at Stanford University. He is also the founder and CEO of Well Money, whose work and research focuses on building financial solutions and education for the Black diaspora. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ziegler. And one more question for you. Uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you, how can they do that? Um, find me on LinkedIn, please. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks yes, for having me. Absolutely. So that's our show. We're just out of time, but thank you so much for being with us. Uh, the United States of Anxiety is a production of WNYC Studios. Our theme music was written by Hannes Brown and performed by the Outer Borough Brass Band. Sound designed by Jared Paul. Milton Ruiz was at the board for the live show. Special thanks to Mike Purvis for this episode. Our team also includes Emily Botine, Regina Deheer, Karen Frillman, Luke Green, Katie Steele, and Kai Wright. And I'm Kusha Navidar. You can keep in touch with me on Twitter at Kusha Navidar. And I want to know, what questions do you have about cryptocurrency that we didn't answer? Send us a message and bonus points if it's a voice memo. Our email address is anxiety at wnyc.org. And as always, I hope you'll join us for our next show next Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Kai will be back. You can stream it at wnyc.org or tell your speaker to play WNYC. Until then, thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>